The World Health Organization uh, defines the social determinants of health as the conditions in which uh, people are born, they grow, they go to school, they work, and then they age. Um, so if you take that definition, um, social determinants of health is pretty much everywhere around us. Uh, it consists of the quality of education and schooling that we received. Um, that's a social determinant of health. Um, it consists of the quality of the neighborhoods in which we grow up, uh, the kind of um, jobs that we do, how much income we make. Uh, these are all you know, um, social determinants of health when we pause to think about it. The uh, distribution of the social determinants of health is determined by uh, differences in people's access to power, to income, to resources. So you can see that um, uh, it's really um, societal inequalities which determine differences in our access to or exposure to social determinants of health. And so another way of putting that is if we can change people's exposure to differences in um, social conditions, then we may help to reduce uh, inequalities in health. If we can improve um, people's access to education, to secure jobs and, and um, uh, you know, healthful neighborhoods, uh, these will all help to reduce health inequalities. Yeah, I, I think it's um, true uh, at one level that people are responsible for their own uh, lifestyle choices. What um, social determinants of health adds on top of that is that uh, people's choices are constrained. They're constrained by the um, conditions under which we grow up. They're constrained by the education that we receive, uh, and so on and so forth. So what we're really trying to say is that um, uh, responsibility matters, but um, so does ensuring that everybody gets a fair go. You know, we need to ensure a level playing field um, such that, for instance, uh, people are not uh, uh, exposed, that people, there's freedom from exposure to misleading information that's provided by food companies, for example. That's a social determinant of health. Uh, such that, you know, no matter how um, uh, strongly motivated uh, someone is to take charge of their healthy eating habits, it's not going to be enough if the information they receive on packaged food is misleading. So, um, in that sense, you know, we believe in um, the importance of individual responsibility, but uh, there also has to be a level playing field as well. Social determinants of health can seem, you know, very, uh, at once, you know, very large in scale and uh, difficult to intervene on. I, I see at least a couple of very important um, challenges. One is that, uh, uh, what well, uh, relates to uh, social determinants uh, being a form of prevention. So whenever we uh, talk about doing something in social determinants to prevent illness or disease, uh, we're talking about saving statistical uh, victims or statistical lives. And um, when we contrast that to, let's say, personal health care, the story is much less compelling from a public communications perspective. You know, it's always more compelling to talk about saving an identifiable victim rather than saving statistical lives. That's, the, that's one um, issue with prevention which uh, we've always had to grapple with. The other uh, problem is that many social determinants uh, require investments that take quite some number of years in order to um, yield the benefits. If we invest in our children's education, then it could be decades before the um, health dividend, so to speak, you know, can be realized. And often there's a mismatch between that and our uh, politicians' um, life cycles. Um, you have to have the political willpower, or at least an enlightened politician who can see that uh, um, there is societal benefit in doing something today in order that um, some benefit can be reaped decades down the line. So uh, what I'm really saying is that the, in order for the challenges of social determinants to be met, uh, you not only have to have um, a strong evidence base, but you also have to have strong political leadership and will. 
Yeah, so uh, the, uh, of the dozens of um, social determinants of health that uh, I have um, studied, I think there, there are you know, two or three best buys that I think every society should consider um, as you know, something to do that's cost effective, has a, a ton of um, evidence to back it, and uh, will lead to reductions in health inequalities as well as promotion of general health. So first among these is investment in early education. I think there's a ton of evidence that the earlier we start to invest in quality education, um, the better uh, the uh, subsequent lives of the children who are uh, benefited. Um, and that's not only true in terms of later school readiness and uh, competitiveness in the job market, but also their health behaviors as well. So early education is number one on my list of best buys. I think uh, we, we also need um, strong um, and secure job conditions uh, that uh, people have to be assured uh, the prospect of a decent paying job in order to uh, be able to also have a reason to invest in their later health. It's very difficult to take responsibility um, of your own health when um, you don't know what's going to happen to you tomorrow. And for that reason, I am a strong believer in um, active labor market policies as a way to promote population health. And then lastly, I think um, uh, in uh, uh, many developing, developed countries, the growing gap in the wealth and incomes of the top versus the middle uh, is a major public health concern. I think we need to stem the tide of growing inequality as a um, urgent matter for improving public health. Behavior economics is, uh, is simply an emerging, well, I shouldn't say emerging, behavior economics has been around for about um, 20 years. But in the field of public health, I, I sense that uh, its impact is still emerging. I think it's, it is the field of economics which um, uh, tackles the problem of irrationality um, head on. It, it, it's a, it basically revises uh, the notion that most of us behave in rational ways that weigh the costs and benefits of different kinds of behavior, whether it's um, uh, stopping smoking or eating Krispy Kremes or going to the gym. All of these behaviors um, have until now been um, analyzed in uh, public health as if they were deliberately planned behaviors, but I think we now understand from insights in behavior economics that much of it happens in an automatic way, and behavior economics is simply uh, giving us a set of tools by which to analyze these behaviors and then to try to um, uh, nudge people in directions that are in their long-term health interest. When we review the uh, advertising tactics of the industries that uh, we, we often have to deal with, uh, tobacco industry, um, food industry, uh, television and advertising industries, uh, that, that uh, we, we now realize that for decades they have been utilizing concepts from behavioral economics, for example, appealing to consumers' um, emotions in order to sell their product, uh, that uh, we ha in public health have yet to fully uh, take on board. And so it seems to me that uh, uh, students in public health could learn a great deal from, uh, from the field of behavioral economics as well as uh, related fields of psychology and, and neurosciences to try to make more effective the kind of um, health messaging uh, and health promotion uh, strategies that we employ.